out. Okay. Okay, so this is part two of the nuclear weapons lecture. And we ended by talking about fission. And now I'm going to talk to you about what is incredible and changed the world forever. What they realized is that fission doesn't just happen spontaneously where you need to wait millions of years for it to decay into these two neutrons and so on. But if you actually bombard the uranium-235 nucleus with a neutron, and actually it's useful to have a really low energy neutron, so not a, not a, very, fat, not a very high energy neutron, then what will happen is the U-235 will split into fission products and release two or three neutrons. And that was a big surprise. And that's called induced fission, induced fission. So in the process, you release a lot of energy. And here you can really see why, it's, why fission is, is so powerful in that sense and why I had the, the slide with the nuclear difference. Um, if you look at the amount of energy that's released from just one fission, just from one splitting, it's 200 million electron volts. And don't worry so much about what electron volts means, but here you can compare it to coal burning. So here it's 2 million electron volts per atom, and from coal burning, it's 18 electron volts per atom. So a vastly different energy scale. And that's why people are interested in using it for weapons, which is awful but also for uh, nuclear reactors. And what's left over are these fission products, FP, that I have there. And these are the isotopes that are left over that tend to be radioactive. And, um, and they're the ones who give the bullets and they're the ones that are, that are dangerous um, when it comes to uh, a nuclear reactor accident or when it comes to um, a, a, a nuclear explosion. And here is what is incredible and changed the world. If you take one of these neutrons, what you can do is one of these neutrons can then induce fission in another U-235. If you put these U-235s close enough together, that neutron that comes off will find a U-235 and that will split. And then that will give off a neutron and that will split and so on and so on. And you start what's called a chain reaction. And you also build up a lot of energy. And here you see a picture of a chain reaction. So here we have U-235, that's the first generation. It's split by one neutron. It splits into two pieces, let's say barium-141 and krypton-92 in this case here. That gives off more neutrons. Um, it can be two or three neutrons. That finds a U-235, then that splits, and so on and so on and so on. And if you just count the number of nuclei that you have here, number of splittings is an awful lot. It gets to be very, very quick, so two here, here it's three, here it's six, and so on and so on. It happens very quickly. A useful analogy of a way you can kind of think about this is in terms of mouse traps. And that's why here I had a mouse trap here with two neutrons and a neutron coming off here, and the mouse trap is being um, unclamped, and the neutrons just kind of fly off here and, and hit the um, U-235s. So this is, of course, in two dimensions, not in three dimensions. It's not like a, a solid. But imagine the picture of taking a different mousetrap with ping pong balls on top of them and putting them very close together and then triggering them with throwing one uh, uh, ping pong ball and that will unclamp one. Then this ping pong ball will jump over here and it will unclamp that one and then so on and so on and so on. And that's how you get a chain reaction. And that is really how nuclear weapons um, work. Oops, sorry. And so this kind of shows you that here. So as you can see, it's a very, very violent process. Um, we started by just throwing one ping pong ball inside. We started by throwing one ping pong ball inside 
And that started the whole chain reaction to continue over and over and over again. We're, gonna, we're talking about the science, but never forget, and the science is interesting, um, but never forget the unspeakable horror of, um, of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What I always say is that, um, for me, the artwork that's done by the survivors are, is much more powerful than any pictures, and this is one of them that, that, that really um, shows you the, the horror. So how do you get an extremely fast chain reaction? Well, you increase the mass of material, so little neutrons escape from the chain, from the, from the, um, from the chain reaction. So you saw in the, uh, in the video before that there was a plexiglass um, container around it. If you would not have that plexiglass, then the balls would just disappear and it wouldn't sustain the chain reaction. So the goal here is to do something similar with nuclear weapons and make sure you keep those neutrons inside the box, essentially, so the, the chain reaction is sustained. And this is where the concept of critical mass, which I'm sure you've heard about before, um, comes in. If I have a very small amount of material, so this represents the amount of uranium-235 or even plutonium-239, that's the other isotopes, iso other isotope, um, that you can use to make nuclear weapons. And there's other isotopes as well, but these are the ones that we really focus on, uranium-235 and plutonium-239. If I have this amount, this amount of material, you can see a neutron come in here like this. Um, it starts up and then um, it induces fission. You can see the sort of three arms there and then it continues, but a lot more tend to escape the ball than tend to go backwards and go inside and induce more fissions. If I increase the amount of um, the amount of material, then like I have in the center uh, picture, then what happens is when the neutron comes in and it gets triggered, you have a lot of the neutrons that tend to go back into the material and cause the, cause more fissions to be produced than neutrons actually escaping. So the critical mass is that there's enough material that on average more neutrons are produced than escape. And, and, that's, and that's the whole goal. And then you have a supercritical mass where you have even more material. And so you produce a very fast, uh, very fast uh, chain reaction. The last slide on the right is also a critical mass, but you prevent the neutrons from escaping by having a reflector around it. Um, and so that means that you also have to use less critical, uh, less fissile material, which is expensive, like uranium or plutonium and you can get away with using you know, a only a few kilograms or something like this. And you see that that reflector that's around it in dark blue, that reflector is very similar to having the, um, the plexiglass cover over the mousetraps. And so now you understand a lot about how nuclear weapons work. So the key to nuclear weapons is really managing all the neutrons. You have to make sure there's enough neutrons to continue the chain reaction, and you have to make sure that no neutrons escape or get absorbed through other interactions. So how much material is necessary? Well, what we can do here is we can plot in terms of a first generation, second generation, and here we are assuming that it only goes up by factors of two. So you get the first splitting, you produce two neutrons, those two neutrons happen to find U-235s and then splits another two neutrons, so you have four and then eight and so on and so on and so on. The time between the neutron splitting and finding another one to split is only 10 to the minus eight seconds. So it's a very short period of time. That's 10 nanoseconds, so 10 millionth of a second. And that um, physicists call a shake. And if you look at the different generations now, the first generation was one, the second generation is two, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32. You can see that once you get to the 64th generation, it becomes nine times 10 to the exponent 18. So the, the exponent 18 means 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, many tens, in fact, 18 tens. So you're multiplying 10 18 times. 
But once you get to 80, so once we get to 80, we get this interesting number, six times 10 to the 23, six times 10 to the 23, which some of you may recognize as being a mole. And then you get to two to the exponent 80, that's 1.2 times 10 to the 24, so it's two times six times 10 to the 23, or two moles. And then you have another splitting, which is two to the exponent 81, which is twice 1.2 times 10 to the 24, so you get 2.4 times 10 to the 24. So that's now four moles. So that already tells you if you have 235 grams per mole, you need only about 235 times four grams to be equivalent to 82 generations of fission energy. Just to explain that a little bit more, this is a little back of the envelope calculation. If you have two to the exponent 81, that's 2.4 times 10 to the 24 fissions, right? Every fission is 200 million electron volts per fission. So now, if you multiply this number of fissions times 200 million electron volts, and then convert all that energy of you know, so many fissions to so many, so many millions of electron volts to TNT, you find that it's equivalent to 18 kilotons TNT, which is basically very similar. These are all approximations, but these numbers are very similar to the bombs that were dropped on um, Hiroshima. If we look at how much time did it take to produce all that energy? Well, there were 82 generations and there were 10 nanoseconds per generation. And so if you just multiply 82 or let's say 100 times 10 to the minus eight, that's 10 to the exponent minus six, and that's one microsecond. So in one microseconds, you are able to produce all that energy, 18 kilotons of TNT, in a very small fit, very small space, and so um, it naturally explodes. And then, basically, what I was just telling you before is that the mass of U two thirty five that fissioned is four moles, or four times six times ten to the twenty three atoms. So that's four times two hundred thirty five, and that's basically one kilogram of uranium two thirty five, and that's the origin of the nuclear difference. Um, picture that I showed you, where on this one side I'm showing you one kilogram of TNT that's exploding, and on the other side I'm showing you one kilogram of uranium-235 that's, that's exploding, essentially, with such a tremendous difference in yield. So properties important for nuclear weapons is physical, fissile material, so that's the uranium-235 and plutonium-239, those stuff that you use for nuclear weapons, um, the, the critical mass is important, the ease of handling so that it's not going to be very radioactive and difficult to handle, the neutron background because if you have a high spontaneous fission rate, so that's the rate that you could just have natural fissions that is not induced but it's kind of naturally happening, that's not good because then you're not triggering the nuclear weapon um, properly and so you really won't get a very high yield. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and there's generally really two ways of a fission bomb assembly. One is called the gun type design, and the other type is called the implosion type design. On the left side, I'm showing the gun type nuclear weapon, and on the right side, I'm showing the implosion type weapon. In the case of the gun type uh, design, all you're doing is basically taking a little bit more than the critical mass. Here I'm saying one third, uh, one, one half, but it's more like two thirds and you take another piece of critical mass, which is also something like two thirds, and you smash them together really, really fast so that you assemble more than a critical mass. And if you do that, then you've produced exactly you know, a super critical mass, and that will just uh, naturally fission, um, and then you, well, you, you trigger it, and then it will fission and produce a very, very fast chain reaction, um, just like um, Hiroshima, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. Um, and on the right side, I'm showing implosion type design. And here it's a different approach. Here you're not using, for the left side, you're using uranium-235 as an isotope. But on the right side, you're using plutonium-239 or uranium-235. But you can't use plutonium for the gun type design. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, next. 
So the, the idea with the implosion design is that you have high explosives on the outside, and then you have this thin kind of ring here, which is kind of this shell of, um, uh, uh, of um, fissile material like uranium-235 or plutonium-239. And then you crush it together in a bomb by having explosives go up. So this is all high explosive. It goes up, out, like outward like this. But then you have uh, what's called the rocket effect, essentially. You have an equal action and reaction. And you get kind of a compression um, effect as well. And when you compress it, you bring all those atoms, those U-235s or plutonium 239s very close together. So once you get a fission, it's very easy to find another atom and continue the, the chain reaction. Okay, so those are the two different types. So one question that often comes up is can a non-state actor build nuclear weapons? So can terrorists, for example, build nuclear weapons? Well, the barrier is getting the fissile materials, getting to assemble the uranium-235 or the plutonium-239. And um, uh, people around the world are trying to secure that material so that it doesn't fall in the hands of, of terrorists. In the 1960s, the US government asked two students that just graduated from grad school to design a gun type bomb. Ah, that's another thing I didn't tell you is this is actually as much simpler design as you can imagine. You're taking two pieces and you're just slamming them together. And um, this is a quote by uh, uh, Louis Alvarez, who won the Nobel Prize, is a real expert in, in real, real good physicist, who said that even a high school kid could do this in terms of designing a fissile material, designing a gun type design. And the critical problem here is actually getting to um, the uranium-235, the highly enriched um, uranium-235. So in the 1960s, the government asked two students that just graduated from grad school to design a gun-type bomb. They had no knowledge of nuclear weapons in general, and they designed an implosion-type bomb instead. Um, there was a Princeton un University undergrad student who designed an implosion weapon as a kind of a senior paper. So this is not such high technology, it's not so difficult. It's really the barrier is getting the materials and getting to know how, how to handle the different metals and the materials. Um, there was also the labs. So this is the uh, nuclear physics labs in, in the United States, such as Los Alamos or, uh, or Livermore labs. So these are the ones that built nuclear weapons and designed them in the past. They were tasked to, in a few months, build a gun type bomb with commercially available material without breaking any laws except for the fissile material. And they were able to do that. So this shows you that having a, a, a gun type design, um, it's even possible for a non-state actor or terrorists or, or others to actually build one. So the, the important thing is to secure the fissile material, make sure it doesn't fall into the hands of uh, terrorists. And this is the mass of fissile material that are needed for a nuclear weapon. So you can see here the yield in terms of kilotons. So again, a kiloton is a lot. It's 1 million kilograms of the equivalent of 1 million uh, kilogram TNT explosion. If you have a, if you want to have a 1 million uh, kilogram TNT explosion, the amount of plutonium that you would need would only be about three kilograms if you were uh, if if you were kind of a country that's starting out with low technical capability, if it's a country that's been making nuclear weapons for a very long time, they only need one kilogram of plutonium. If you want to have a one kiloton yield explosion, but you want to use highly enriched uranium or this high amount, high fraction of this uranium two thirty five isotopes that's so useful as the fuel of a of a nuclear explosive device. In that case, if you have low technical capability, so a country that's just starting out, they would need only to have eight kilograms of that material. And if they have higher, high technical capability, they need about 2.5 um, kilograms. So um, it's, it's, you don't need that much material, don't have to acquire that much material to produce um, a large yield. This goes up only slightly, you know, factor here going from one to 20, it went up here from eight to 16. So by a factor of two. So if you want to produce a 20, 20 kiloton yield, you'd have to have about 16 uh, kilograms of um, U-235 
uh, material. Um, it doesn't take into account things like losses and so on into um, uh, you know, machining and so on. So you'll need a little bit more like that because there will be losses and that are associated with, um, uh, with manufacturing the bomb. Um, but these are the kinds of amounts that you need to have. In 2008, as part of the six party talks, North, North Korea actually declared that they had to do this. They had declared that two kilograms of plutonium were used for their 2006 test, which was a fizzle. It wasn't a very large test, but they used only two kilograms of plutonium. And in 2012, the Soviet test results were declassified and they said that 0.8 kilograms of plutonium was used to produce a bomb um, of 1.6 kilotons. So these are highly uh, technical uh, designs uh, from, from, from a country that's used to uh, building uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, and for this reason, uh, Oli Heinonen and others um, have, have called for the, what's called a significant quantity, um, the amount that's generally considered to be the amount you need for nuclear weapons to really be decreased to much lower numbers. So can plutonium be used in a gun type design? Well, I already said no, but I didn't say why. The reason is, is because you just have too many neutrons that are given off from the material. If you assemble the amount of material in this, in, you know, in the amount of a uh, a critical mass, once you bring it together, there's just too many neutrons. In this case, uh, if you have plutonium, it naturally gives off um, 100,000 neutrons per second per kilogram. So a lot of neutrons are already given off. So it's, 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 it's difficult to, or impossible to assemble it um, so that you have a gun type design that you can really uh, uh, take the one piece and, and smash them together fast enough. You really need to have a uh, implosion type design for this purpose. So you need faster assembly such as the implosion type design and in this case what you're doing is you're just basically compressing it and by doing that you decrease the uh, amount that you need for the critical mass. So by compressing it uh, by a factor of two uh, it results in a reduction of the critical mass that you need by a factor of four. So there's a huge plus in, um, in, in doing it this way in terms of less material and and, and so on. Okay, so the idea is that you have a lot of uh, um, fissile material in the kind of center and center ring, and then you have the detonators that are on the outside, and they'll produce kind of this spherical shock wave um, uh, towards where, the, where this um, spherical shell of fissile material is, and it will compress it into a little ball um, so that you have assembled the um, critical mass. So can you make a bomb with reactor grade plutonium? So what I didn't tell you is that there's many different types of plutonium. There's actually plutonium-239 um, that's produced when you take ordinary uranium from a reactor and so reactor fuel and you place it in a reactor then some of that uranium will convert to plutonium with every single reactor. And the type of plutonium that you produce is sometimes uh, if it's, it's going to be producing plutonium-239. But if you wait long enough, then that plutonium-239 captures a neutron and becomes plutonium-240. And just like when I talked about the different isotopes acting differently, plutonium-239 and plutonium-240, even though they only have one neutron different, act completely differently. Uh, and so people have said in the past that with reactor-grade plutonium, uh, you don't need to have, uh, uh, you, you can't really make a nuclear weapon with reactor grade plutonium. Um, but in fact, that's not true. And here I'll just show you how the critical masses change, um, which we've talked about is so important. If you take weapons grade, so WG represents weapons grade plutonium. So this is really where you have a high amount of plutonium to 39, then you only need to have 11 kilograms um, sphere. If you have reactor grade plutonium, it's only 30% more material that you need. In the case of highly enriched uranium, just a bare sphere with no reflector around and so on, you need to have 56 kilograms to have a critical mass. So you see that even if you have reactor plutonium, it's still, you can definitely make a nuclear um, 
uh, weapon um, out of it. Um, the other point is that plutonium-240, the one that I said that's being produced in a reactor that some people say is not useful for nuclear weapons, um, it actually fissions itself, but it doesn't fission with slow neutrons like uranium-235 and plutonium-239 do. They fission with fast neutrons. And it just so happens in the process of um, fissioning process, you're producing fast neutrons exactly the ones that would fission also plutonium-240. So what that means is that the concept that plutonium-240, by, by waiting a long time in a reactor for it to turn to a higher fraction of plutonium-240, uh, that it's, it can't be used for a nuclear weapon, is not true. All, all you know, grades of plutonium can be used for a nuclear weapon. So a military useful first generation nuclear explosive using reactor grade plutonium can be designed to produce a nuclear yield in the multi kiloton range. So even if you're just using stuff that comes straight from a reactor, um, it can still be used for a nuclear weapon. With reactor grade plutonium, the yield would be at least one kiloton and more and likely much, much higher. So now let's talk about modern nuclear weapons. So what we basically discussed up to now is the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The, the new weapons that are used and also likely the weapons that North Korea tested are called boosted nuclear weapons or staged nuclear weapons. So boosted nuclear weapons is where you add a small amount of another isotopic gas. So this is actually hydrogen gas that's been changed into different isotopes of hydrogen. So deuterium and tritium are two isotopes of hydrogen. And once you take that kind of hydrogen gas and you put it into the core of the nuclear weapons, then when you go through the implosion uh, process, it produces a high amount of heat. And that heat actually causes a fusion, the Ds and the Ts to fuse together. And this produces even more neutrons. And so any inefficiency that you had before through the explosion process, the energy generation process, now because you get this extra huge burst of neutrons, any inefficiency that you had there before um, is now not a problem anymore. And so you can have uh, much higher yield, much, high, much larger um, explosions if you do this boosting uh, uh, process. So it increases the efficiency and thus the yield. And also you're secured from this process of what they call pre-detonation, where as I was explaining, if you have some neutrons that happen to come when you're trying to assemble um, uh, you know, two critical masses, um, they can kind of cause problems. Like for example, plutonium 240s has too many neutrons, it does cause problems. It just, you can still make a nuclear weapon out of it. But if you use boosted weapons, then you can be secured that you get much higher um, yields in this way. The other major advance is the hydrogen bomb. And these are staged nuclear weapons. So the idea here is that you use the, and modern nuclear weapons, they tend to use implosion de, uh, designs. They don't use gun type designs anymore um, because there's all kinds of advantage, disadvantages with um, uh, gun type design because you're using so much material when you do a gun type design and there's lots of problems with gun type designs. So what's called the primary is kind of a trigger for the secondary and the secondary is your fusion bomb. Okay, that's really when we talk about a hydrogen bomb. So what happens is the implosion itself triggers the bomb. So the primary is going to be where you have the fission implosion bomb. Um, then you get boosting, which increases the efficiency that generates heat and heats the secondary, and then the fusion reactions will start. This will lead to further fissions and in the process produce very, very large yields. And here I'm showing you how it would be deployed uh, in, a, uh, um, in, in, in a nuclear weapon uh, where it would be, you know, a missile or something would deliver it inside the reentry body um, of the missile, the nose cone of the missile. You would place the bomb in, in something like this. 
So those are modern nuclear weapons. So in terms of nuclear weapon types, there's the pure fission, which is the gun type and implosion type design. There's the boosted, which inserts a small amount of deuterium tritium gas. There's the modern weapons, which use the implosion weapons as a trigger for the fusion stage. And in the process, you produce an enormous amount of energy. So for example, a uh, 40 megaton bomb is equivalent to one second of energy of the sun on the earth. One second of energy on the sun, of the sun on the earth. So it's enormous uh, amount of energy uh, that can cause um, enormous uh, damage. So there's vastly more energy from nuclear reactions than chemical reactions. Um, the critical mass is the mass of fissile material that is required to sustain the chain reaction. We went through the first use phase when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima, Hiroshima and, uh, and Nagasaki. And then over the process, they built more and more nuclear weapons. They did a lot of nuclear testing, which I'm also going to be discussing. Um, they have the boosted and the multi-stage design. And um, then there's the industrial scale production of more and more nuclear weapons and then slow reduction phase, which we are kind of in now. Um, but I'm fear, fear, fear that this is not where it ends. And this is where we are now. And this kind of scary image, yes, it's probably a little bit exaggerated. Um, but um, in uh, a few years ago, uh, um, uh, Vladimir Putin in, uh, in the Russian Federation uh, announced new types of, that are developing new types of nuclear weapons, uh, new scary designs, um, things like uh, nuclear powered um, uh, um, cruise missiles that can deliver nuclear weapons, the one that just uh, had a failure um, in, during the summer. Um, th there's, there's lots of dangerous like uh, nuclear torpedoes. This kind of what I'm showing here, this kind of dramatic picture. Um, it's all um, really awful. On the US side, they're interested in building uh, low yield nuclear weapons, which might make it uh, easier for some people to consider using them, and it might be slippery slope um, for using them. Um, so I fear, I fear, I fear that we're, this is not um, the end of the story. Let's hope I'm wrong. This just shows you kind of a quick picture of the nuclear tests that have been conducted um, over the years. There's no sound here, but if you go online, you'll find the one which has sound and this goes very, very fast through all the different explosions um, that have been conducted um, over the years. The first two that you saw were of course um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And now you'll see all these flashes of light. These are when the, the Soviet Union and the United States um, were testing. And you see the year here up in the right, 1955. Um, and you can see, I think I'll just um, stop talking so that you can see this to the end because it's nice and it's very short. So yeah, it's like a moment of silence. I mean, it's so awful, all these tests that have been conducted. A lot of the tests were conducted on the surface, um, atmospheric tests where all that radioactivity just went into the air and deposited on nearby places. This happened in the United States and this happened also uh, in the Soviet Union and in Kazakhstan and, um, and other places around the world, the Marshall Islands um, and so on. Okay, so you get a sense at how many tests were conducted over the years. Right now, there's no need for full-scale nuclear testing. Um, as Bruce Goodwin said, who is the Principal Associate Director for Weapons at Livermore National Lab and, uh, and uh, the head of the National Nuclear Security Administration, which is the main organization responsible for nuclear weapons um, in the United States, they both said this, we have a more fundamental understanding of how these weapons work today than we ever imagined when we were blowing them up. 
We know more about the complex issues of nuclear weapons performance today than we ever did during the period of nuclear testing. Because what they did is after, um, it was basically now, thank goodness, a moratorium, and let's hope it lasts, on nuclear testing all over the world. Of course, uh, North Korea has violated that moratorium. But basically, they did all kinds of tests to prove um, that the safety of nuclear weapons, that they can't just, um, they can't just explode, uh, and they learned a lot about how nuclear weapons work, and it doesn't require them anymore um, to actually explode nuclear weapons. Of course, that's true for the United States and the Russian Federation, but that might not be true for countries that are interested in nuclear weapons or starting out in nuclear weapons, like for example, North Korea, that need to test to understand how nuclear weapons work so they can build more of them and they can miniaturize them so that they can put them on uh, missiles. So I will stop there. Okay, I'm gonna uh, stop recording.